thank y'all for being here for the whole event and honestly thank you for being here for this talk I appreciate it um, basically what I'm going to show you today is something we've been doing for the last few years here uh, at QDMA headquarters which is no-till food plots with minimal equipment um, I started not too long ago starting to hear different voices in the agriculture community uh, working hard to train farmers and break them the, of the habit, the old tradition of disking everything all the time and again and again and every year and over and over and training them to begin to go toward no-till uh, for the very simple reason that soil is built from the top down. Nature builds dirt and soil and nutrients and plant health from the surface down. And when you disc, you are upending that process. You are turning everything upside down and you are breaking down the process of soil nutrient buildup and micro buildup and the organic nature of soil that allows plants to thrive. And so these voices in the, in the agricultural community started trying to encourage farmers to use various techniques and we'll talk about some. Um, but the bottom line, what we've learned with food plots messing around with this is from big ag operations with big equipment all the way down to a person <coughs> with five acres of land and no equipment, we can all do no-till organic food plots. And the reason you would want to, there's a lot of them, and I'll get into some of those today, but you can save money on your fertilizer bill. You save money on your fuel bill because you're not disking as much. Um, in many cases, people who didn't think they could do food plots because they couldn't disc or didn't have the equipment can do food plots using this approach. Um, and, there's, and then there's uh, environmental benefits. You're reducing soil erosion, which again benefits you and your food plots. Uh, you're avoiding pesticides, herbicides, and other things running off into streams and dirt running off into streams. You're basically going with the way nature intended to build soil and it saves you in the long run in a lot of ways and has a lot of benefits for wildlife, uh, the woods, the waters, and everything else that we appreciate. So that's kind of the overview of what we're going to talk about. And this plot right here behind us um, has not been disked in about three years. I think for three, this, uh, when I plant this in a week or two, this will have been the uh, fourth round of food plots on this plot that has not been disked. Um, and then we've got some others that we're beginning to do the same way. So what I want to show you basically is this part that you're standing on right now is ready to plant. All I have to do is broadcast seed on top of this when the rain is coming and I'm off to the races. So a lot of people would look at that and go, no, that's not ready. We got to disc that. We got to have nice, fluffy, clean seed bed. I don't want to see sticks. I don't want to see rocks. I don't want to see weeds. Uh, I just want to see dirt. And that's the old farming tradition. Um, and it's so ingrained in our culture that that's just what everybody, I mean, I feel it. You know, I want to see that. That's what you think you need to do to plant. Um, so it takes breaking of some old habits. But what I want to um, just show you, this is very easy. It is not difficult to do. And again, the reason that you want to do it is soil is built from the top down. I'm probably going to say that several times. But you'll see all of this stuff. This is the residue of last year's crop. I just mowed this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is last year's warm season food plot that we planted. These tall stalks are grain sorghum. It has a seed head on it. Uh, there's some sunflower stalks still left out in here. There's a little bit of volunteer sun hemp that came up that was actually from the previous year, this taller stem right here. And then vines of cow peas and soybeans um, and lab lab all out in here. It, and it makes all this great organic material and you want that. You want that on the top because the way soil is built this type of stuff, dead plant material, falls to the top, leaves. It's big, it's chunky, but it begins to break down over time into smaller and smaller pieces, and that filters down into the layers. The water percolates that down into the layers, and you get finer and finer part, uh, particles down through the top layer of the soil, and the soil begins to build a structure that has pores in it, and those hold together. And ultimately, over time, what you get is you get a whole biotic community. You get earthworms in there. You get smaller things, microbes and bacteria, and all kinds of things in there that live in that structured layer and those pores, and all of that feeds into soil health. Those microbes help break things down. They produce the nutrients, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium, and all the other micronutrients that we want in there and produce them naturally, reducing your fertilizer bill. 
But again, top down, when you disc and turn everything over, you're not only burying that stuff too deep to where it can't break down, uh, you are potentially bringing weed seeds back to the top, and but also you are uh, bringing up and, and fluffing up this soil you get with the fine soil on top and then with with a nice clean field just sitting there what often happens it dries out, it dries out and what do you see when the wind happens when the wind blows dust, dust. dust. that's your top soil going away in the wind blowing off to somewhere else when it rains you see furrows and erosion um, there's a guy on YouTube who's now retired from USDA NRCS his name is Ray Archuleta how many of you have you ever uh, watched Ray give a presentation? Yeah. Ray is one of these well-known evangelists of organic agriculture and the agriculture community has spent his whole career trying to teach farmers this stuff and has converted a bunch of people. He's now retired. But you can go onto YouTube and just search Ray Archuleta Soil and find a bunch of his videos, educational. And one of the things you'll see him do is a demonstration. He'll take two large tubes of water and he'll take a clump of soil from a conventional field and he'll take a clump of soil from a uh, organic field that has not been disked and he'll put them in the tops of those tubes of water. And what happens is in the organic field, that clump sits there on top. Yeah. The pores and the structure of the soil holds together, the water infiltrates, but it doesn't break the soil apart. Whereas in the other tube, that clump of conventional soil simply dissolves down through the tube and in an hour or two, you've got a tube full of gray clay colored water and no clump of dirt. It simply dissolves into that because it has no structure, it has no pores, it has no connectivity to allow, and the water simply penetrates and breaks it up. And what that means is when it rains on a field like that, it all just rolls off. The water also can't penetrate. He does another test with two tubes where the soil is in the bottom of the tube and he pours water on top. And what happens with the no-till soil is the water percolates down through it slowly, down through all the layers and begins to filter out the bottom of the tube. And in the conventional soil, the water just sits on top and can't penetrate and does not go through. And what that means is in your field, water sits on top. It, if you've got a slope, it's rolling off into a stream. It's carrying herbicides, pesticides, and your dirt, and your fertilizer, and the nutrients down into the stream and away from your property and off into the world. And we don't want that. Uh, not just from an environmental concern, but from the fact that we want the dirt and the nutrients and the stuff to stay here in the field with our plot. So those are some good demos. Check those out on YouTube if you get a chance. It's very, you know, convincing to see how this works. Um, you know, you want to see, when you dig down, you want to find earthworms. You want to be able, in, in a good, healthy food plot dirt, it's a good place to dig bait. Earthworms are a good sign that you've got that community beginning to build. And I've already dig, I've dug out here a little bit. I'm starting to find it doesn't happen fast. It does not happen overnight. When you think about it, if you've got a field that's been this for years, you know, you have to build that community there of, of organic soil. And it may take a little while, depending on how long the history there is of the tillage. Now, if you want to do this, if you've got a tractor and you've got maybe a grain drill or you've got a firminator, you can still do this. A firminator, for example, you can adjust that to raise the discs up and you're not disking as heavy and you're using the cultipacker cedar right. combo without the discs. Okay. And you can do essentially what I'm gonna show you we do here, we just don't have a firminator. So no matter your level from a bunch of equipment to no equipment, you can do this. Um, and the process is pretty simple. You leave this field, this is a warm season plot we grew last year. And I'll just point out to you these T-posts around and that roll of plastic fence over there we couldn't grow this plot here without that because the density of deer is here pretty high. And as most of y'all know, you can't grow cow peas and soybeans uh, in small plots or in areas with high deer density because they wipe it out. Right. Um, so we have to put that plastic fence up. We put it up right after we plant. And then what we do is once the crop is mature and, and established and ready to withstand browse pressure, we'll roll the bottom of the fence up and begin to let the deer in here. If we see that they're kind of waxing it and wiping it out, which they will, we'll roll the fence back down and, and lock them out again and let the plot kind of recover until bow season comes in in September. Then we, again, strategically open up the fence for hunting opportunity. People have shot deer out of that redneck blind right there with bows and crossbows in this plot in September and October. They've also shot them in ladder stands down the hill here, catching deer coming on an approach up the hill to this. So, you know, the fence itself is a great hunting strategy. 
Uh, but the other thing is it allows us to grow crops like this. Now here what we did with this, in some cases, you know, you might want to have a warm season summer mm. plot and then turn that to a cool season plot in September, October for hunting through the fall. We didn't do that here. We basically let the deer feed in here until frost killed the beans and peas and all the legumes and things, which is usually November, maybe yeah. December, just dependent, dependent on. So you get a good bit of hunting season out of a plot like this, then you leave it alone and you just let it stay here. And that's what we did, as you can see. You don't worry about the weeds coming up that you'll see through winter. All of this, as you study organic agriculture, what you find is cover crops is a big word that they really push people to think about. And that means don't, when farmers harvest their crops, they're trying to teach them, don't go out there the day after and disc it all under and let it sit out there as bare dirt all winter. Not only is it washing away, blowing away in the wind, but also you're destroying the, the community that I was talking about earlier, bacteria and organisms and things. It's dead out there. The water ponds on top, it's not penetrating. You're not retaining any of that winter rain in the soil profile. So they're trying to teach them to do cover crops. Keep the soil covered with either crop residue or something green that you plant. Because the growing thing in winter, whatever the cover crop is, even if it's not something you harvest or not something deer are eating, is holding the soil in place, is feeding the microbes and maintaining that community that's building that soil that we want to have. So it's basically holding everything together until you're ready to grow a crop again. So. Looking out here and seeing green weeds and organic uh, uh, cover residue is good. This is what you want to see through winter. There's no problem with that. Even if deer aren't eating that, this is part of building that organic soil profile. So what we'll do with this now, and I've already kind of done a demo here, is when you're ready to plant, which it's, it's almost time now or is time now and with soil temperatures here in Georgia to go ahead and we could plant a warm season crop now or we could wait a little bit. Um, I came in here, I mowed this, and the next thing you're gonna do, the next step, is, as you can see, I did it about a week ago, this stuff's already dying, is I sprayed this with glyphosate, uh, two ounces to the gallon. Um, and I did it with a backpack sprayer. So, okay, let's say, well, I don't have a tractor or a bush hog. Have you got a push mower at home? Have you got a riding mower at home that you could trailer and come out here and raise the deck up and cut this? Yes, you could. I could run this over with a riding mower in a small enough plot, if you've got small acreage, and let's say you've got a little hidey hole plot out somewhere off a fire break you can't get to, you can do this with hand tools. Get a couple of buddies and some sling blades if the stuff is heavy enough cover and get out here and just knock it down. The point of that is, again, to get this stuff down on top of the surface, protecting the soil from rain and erosion and everything else, and beginning to break down. But also, the other part is, if I came out in here and this heavier stuff with my backpack sprayer, yeah, you're not gonna do all of this structure and the taller green stuff is going to prevent me from really getting an effective kill on everything here mm -hmm. so you mow it cut it down to the ground you give it a few days to kind of <sighs> begin to return to, to grow back the plants and grasses and things that are there to grow back from the mowing but yet still be relatively low and then you come in you get a good effective kill whether you do that with a four-wheeler tank sprayer a backpack sprayer a garden pump sprayer Whatever, you know, whatever you've got, you can do it with any of that. You use your glyphosate, you get a good kill on it, and then you're ready to plant. And all you need is what? Rain. You need a good rain. Because we're not going to disc this. We're not going to till in the seed. We're not going to, you know, a lot of people go there and crank the spread, crank your seed, and then what you do, disc it in. We're not going to disc it in. But seeds like this are pretty big seeds. They can't just lay out on top of bare dirt waiting to germinate. They're probably not going to germinate. And birds are probably going to eat them and everything else. You need, uh, you need something to kind of help incorporate the seeds into this layer of organic stuff you've done. And rain is the key. And this is part of the trick of this is you wait until a day when you know you've got rain coming. Maybe it's even raining right now. That's good. But if you've got a good thunderstorm uh, chance this afternoon, that's the day you want to wait on. You come out here with your broadcast spreader when it's looking like this. It could even happen the day, let's say you spray that morning to kill this stuff. You know you got it sprayed. It's not gonna really start dying and looking dead for a few days to a week or more. But if your rain is coming that afternoon and the soil temperature's right, you could broadcast right then into this, the seeds in there. And what happens is you get a good heavy rain, good timing, and I'm talking about a, a decent spring, summer thunder shower. I'm not talking about a mist. You need a good soaking because what that ultimately I found is it ends up doing is kind of, you need something to sort of settle those bigger seeds, cowpeas, soybeans, things like that, down into this layer of mulch. 
you know, if I sprinkle salt on your carpet, you're gonna have a hard time finding it. And smaller seeds like chicory and brassicas and clover that are tiny, they're not gonna be as big of a problem with seed con soil contact broadcasting on something like this. They're gonna filter down in there. They'll be fine even if it doesn't rain that afternoon. But when you're planting bigger seeds like cowpeas and soybeans and lab lab and things like that, you wanna make sure they get settled in and the rain helps do that. Not only that, the moisture wets the seeds and you get good germination. And every year we have done this, I've timed it with a good thunder shower broadcast and I've got pictures. Within seven days, what you'll see is all this will be dead, it'll be dead and brown but a lot of beautiful little cowpea and soybean seedlings coming up through it. It's amazing how well it works. No you tillage. Yeah, I'm just saying you, 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 you think we, No, uh, yes, sometimes we do. And that's what I was yeah. gonna show you. If you look at this piece of equipment over here, um, this is a combo disc and cultipacker. It has a cultipacker on the back that you can lower with a cable. And if I feel like we need to, I'll drop the cultipacker on that and run over this after I broadcast the seed. Basically what I'm trying to do is essentially just stir the top and just get those seeds to settle down in there. I'm not trying to disc or break up the dirt. Simply, and really packing is not really the goal here, it's simply running over this and stirring it around a little bit and, and kind of settling everything down. And then you get your rain and you're off to the races. Trying to get that seed to soil contact. That's right. You want to get that stuff to settle down in the bottom of this bigger mulch layer. The mulch layer helps protect the seeds from drying out, from sun, from birds that will eat it, um, from washing away in the rain and everything else, they'll hold that in place. And the, the germination and the distribution you get out there across this stuff is just perfect, it works great. You'll see that this thing has a set of discs on it, but the discs, with that hand crank, you can float the tires up, raise the discs up. Occasionally, I might lightly touch this with the discs if I really feel like, I don't know, it, it's just not quite enough in spots if I'm seeing bare dirt or something like that, but I don't want to use the disc if I can help it. In fact, the discs on that thing are rusted because we haven't used them in a while. Um, and so that's basically it. You mow or somehow lower this down so that you can then spray. And then when you've got a good rain coming, you broadcast your seed. So walk over here and see if you can see the seeds. And you can see a lot of them are sitting out on top. So you just leave it alone here. Would but if you? you walk, if you reach down here with your hand, and a lot see it here in areas where you can see it down, it's falling down in among this stuff and other places it happens. But if you just take your hand and do this, and you'll see how it'll kind of settle it down in there. And you wouldn't run a cultipack over this. Yes, you, you can. You would. Yep. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Right. When I, when I say kind of stir it a little bit with your hand, that's yes. what I'm talking about. Is when you run it over it with either a four wheeler or a cultipacker okay. or whatever you've got to hand. Put it now. A what? A drag. Yeah, that's what I was just about to say. Some people have got a drag or a, you see these sort of teeth, uh, uh, drag chains. harrows yeah. or yeah. chains or things like that. The problem with those is in something like this, stuff. it's going to tend to gather up mm -hmm. all that yeah. material mm -hmm. and it's going to do this. Yeah. And you don't want to do that. Not only is that kind of pulling your organic material away and clumping it up, but it's clumping seed up with it too. So those sort of tooth drag harrows, I'd probably be careful about that. Yeah. If you can just ride a four-wheeler over it um, or drag yeah, or just anything that just sort of shakes it or settles it like a cultipacker would has a downward pressure rather than a horizontal works. pressure that yeah. wants to drag. Yeah. So an, old, an old bed spring works. Yeah, we've done those before, but it's still... Again, as it's long as it's not clumping. It if you look back and you see strips of dirt like that, yeah, where it's dragging dirt. and clumping, that's not good. You don't want to do that. You want to keep this evenly distributed over the top and sort of pushing things down. So, I mean, even if you walk along here and you see, you can see some seeds, yeah. don't sweat it, it's okay. Yeah. If you get a good rain this afternoon, you'll come back here in a few days and walk down here and look, and those little peas will germinate your soil. This is the other good thing, is that this soil is so much softer and easier for a uh, germinating seed to penetrate than if this was dissed and it rained and sort of compacted it down into mud. You know, it can it can break those those roots can break down into this so much easier. I mean, I've really never had an issue with germination rate doing this. Hmm. Um, just last October, we or last fall, you know, we got this new 130 acre addition over here. How many of you ha got over yesterday over there and saw the browse cage in the sewer line easement? Right. Okay. There, this sewer line easement right here goes down to this creek. 
and then another easement runs along the creek all the way through our property and it's basically a long linear food plot all the way through it was eaten up with japanese stilt grass when we got the property so last uh, october i went down with the four-wheeler sprayer and i ran one into the other with glyphosate again two ounces to the gallon and burned down that uh, stilt grass i did not mow it that stilt grass just sort of clumped fell down collapsed down onto the surface and it was not so heavy it didn't look like this at all and i just came right behind i had a rain coming a week later i went down there with the now i did i did soil test it and we did use a spreader that pulled behind this four-wheeler broadcast spreader to lime and fertilize obviously you got to do that now you can do that on the day you seed you can do it on the day you spray you can do it well before that out in here you know as long as you get that done always I mean, that should go without saying that you pull a soil test and adjust your uh, pH and check your nutrients. What you will find over time, though, is the more you do this, the less you're going to need fertilizer. And you will find, again, that it's just those nutrients build up. They're maintained naturally. You know, many of these plants, particularly the legumes, as y'all know, legumes produce their own nitrogen, but you may not know, they don't release that until they die. A living legume is not feeding other plants nitrogen there's no benefit in that it's using the nitrogen it doesn't release that back in the soil until the plant itself dies so as these plants are dying and breaking down they're releasing these nutrients because you're not disturbing the soil because you're not disking because you've got plants and animal communities in there using that stuff and recycling it and producing new nutrients it stays in there so you will see your fertilizer bill go down over time um, anyway so back to the sewer line easement uh, we got the fertilizers and lime spread um, shortly after I sprayed. Took that spreader right there, uh, did a blend of oats, wheat, rye, Austrian winter peas, and crimson clover, one end to the other. And those of you that saw the cage down there, you know, it's this tall right now in oats, wheat, rye, and Austrian winter peas, and outside of the plot, it's, it's, it's mowed off. So they've been feeding on that right off. Never dissed it, did not even mow it. Um, now we'll have to come back this summer as those invasive plants return and other weeds return and, and hit that again and then we'll do another cool season probably what i'm gonna do down there this this year you know a few weeks is plant buckwheat anybody ever grown buckwheat a couple people um buckwheat is a very easy plant to grow small seed it's easy to plant and get good germination um very tolerant of different soil levels uh deer will browse it but they will not kill it down like cow peas and soybeans so they'll use it it's a moderate forage but they won't wipe it out honeybees love it if you got bees or you're trying to uh, encourage pollinators it's a great pollinator plant but the best thing about buckwheat is it produces a bunch of biomass and it's a very good phosphorus uh, generator and sharer and so you grow that through spring and summer is what we're gonna do a sort of a soil builder they call it a green manure a plant that helps you build nutrients for future crops and we'll grow that this summer and then if it needs mowing, we'll mow it and spray if we need to, If because if, uh, the buckwheat will mature in about 60, 90 days, I think, does anybody know it's 60? It's six, about 60 days, and then it's going to die and go away anyway, so you don't really need to spray that, but most likely down here, we're going to have more stilt grass, we're going to have other weeds and things coming up in there, and we'll probably need to spray again, but that buckwheat will do just what this is doing. It will contribute back to the dirt, and then we'll plant another cool season plot down there, uh, this fall so you know ideally I, we want to have this sort of no-till cycle on everything we do and like I said remember whether you got a big John Deere and a grain drill or you got nothing you got a rake and a sling blade and a broad hand crank broadcast spreader and a, and a garden pump sprayer you can do this